meeting scientists, talking to them about all these problems, it became clearer and clearer that getting from 51 billion tons of emissions down to zero was necessary for the entire world, particularly uh, for the lives of our children and grandchildren to not be worse off and natural ecosystems not to completely disappear. Hi everyone, I'm here in my office for a special episode of Booktube on my new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. The book is a plan for how the world can get to zero greenhouse gas emissions in time to avoid a climate catastrophe. Through the book, I talk about all the different areas of emissions and suggest with the right innovative policies, innovative science breakthroughs, how we can actually zero out every one of those categories. Let's get started. So when talking to Bill Gates, you got to have a clean and clear background. Sorry, football, you got to get out of here. <laughs> Bill Gates, how are you, my friend? Emmanuel Acho here, former NFL linebacker turned sports analyst and television host, but current author, yes, author. You know, I feel like the wisdom is invaluable and I have questions. What I realized is this, Climate change and talking about race are actually very similar because so many people deny the existence of it. So my question for you, to those that are willfully ignorant about climate change and the existence of climate change, like so many people who are willfully ignorant about racism and the existence of racism, what do you say to people who just don't think climate change is real? Emmanuel, it's great to meet you, and, uh, you know, I'll get rid of my football, too, so that's not distracting me there. Uh, your question is excellent. Like a lot of things, uh, climate injustice is partly because, uh, you know, it's out of sight. Out of sight often means out of mind. If, if you could really see the suffering, people whose crops fail so they can't feed their kids, if that was in your neighborhood, just like a lot of the social injustices, within a few blocks of your house, then I think we would take action because I do think people care. I think young people going through school are seeing not only the science, but also the effects. The wildfires are kind of undeniable. The sea level rise is undeniable. I think if they take the time to look at the data, uh, whether it's on racial inequities or climate, they'll go, wow, this is clear as can be. Hi, Hi, Bill, Bill Gatesy. Gatesy. I'm Mitch. And I'm Greg. This was weird. <laughs> we are ASAP Science, queer science educators and comedians who use social media to try and make science make sense. Make sense? We began our journey as scientists and then transformed our passion for science into a chance to inspire the rest of the world. We are constantly thinking about the climate crisis. Whether we're making videos with Emma Thompson to stop the Canadian government from seismic blasting for oil in Inuit waters. Or explaining catastrophic truths about climate change because we just want as many people as possible to understand what is happening. Also, if you want to do a dance with us, we have heels right in your sides. <laughs> We really appreciate your book on the climate crisis. It can be such a complex and overwhelming subject, and the fact that you made it so digestible is really powerful. So, your book is called How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, but many would argue that the climate disaster is already here. Given the climate disruptions that we are already experiencing, is it realistic to think that a future disaster can be avoided or averted? Well, it's great to meet you guys. Uh, I didn't know you had a a shoe size 10.5, I'll have to think about that. I'm not a very good dancer. It's true that the temperature increase uh, that's already taken place is causing a lot of problems. Every degree makes a gigantic difference here. As long as you keep putting CO2 up into the atmosphere, it gets hotter and hotter. And that's why, even though it seems daunting, we've got to go from 51 billion down all the way uh, to zero. Here's an analogy that's especially helpful. 
The climate is like a bathtub that's slowly filling up with water. Even if we slow the flow of water to a trickle, the tub will eventually fill up and water will come spilling out onto the floor. That's the disaster we have to prevent. Setting a goal to only reduce our emissions, but not eliminate them, won't do it. The only sensible goal is zero. The clarity of zero is very, very important because it means that things that are a 20% or 30% reduction, those should not be the priority if there's a way to innovate the very process, like with electric cars, to get it to completely zero and then say, okay, it's okay that buses are taking kids to school and people are moving around. It's not a sin because we've gone all the way to zero. The bad effects are going to keep growing. Two degrees centigrade is the best we can do, and that is a very ambitious goal. Uh, some people actually are despairing and think it's impossible, but because of innovation, I don't believe that. I believe that although it's hard and it'll take us this whole 30-year period uh, doing our best work every single one of those years, you know, I absolutely think we can get to zero. Every degree counts amazingly. The richest 10% of the world's population is responsible for more than half of the carbon emissions that we have seen since 1990. That is like a staggering figure. And individuals in the richest 1% emit 100 times more than those in the poorest half of the population. So what can everyday people do to challenge billionaires to be responsible for their impact on climate change? You're absolutely right. Uh, I probably have one of the largest carbon footprints because of my travel. So I'm funding things that this year uh, will eliminate that footprint. You know, I'm switching to biofuels that cost almost three times as much. For the non-aviation pieces, I'm paying a company called Climeworks that does the brute force technique called direct air capture. And part of the reason I really like the offsets I'm paying for is that it's catalytic. The more people who buy green aviation fuel, the volume goes up coming down in price and the innovations will be coming along. You know, philanthropic things can make a difference here. I have created a group called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, funding scientists. Uh, so I've spent a bit over two billion so far. I'll do uh, an equivalent of that again. I've been talking with people who do philanthropy and that is absolutely critical. Just like the US is the richest country, needs to drive the innovation, the better off in the United States uh, need to fund and speak out on this as a critical issue. Hey Bill, for everyone who doesn't know, my name is Ariel. The last time we met up, we were talking about your favorite climate change books. And today, we're talking about your climate change mm -hmm. book. For the last 10 years, I've been making videos on YouTube encouraging everyone to read. I know that books can change minds and teach us new things, which is why I'm so excited about your book. In many habitats, so much of the damage that has been done may be already too great to be reversed. There's a really difficult balance between how much money and time do we spend on trying to salvage things that our climate change has already destroyed versus how much money and time do we put into creating the new technologies and trying to stop more damage from happening. Do you think we should be taking a triage approach to the natural world, preserving the things that can still be saved, but focusing more on eliminating the conditions that cause the most harm? So nice to be talking to you again, Ariel. And that's a great question. Uh, you know, the damage of climate change, as you say, it's not just that people will suffer. It's also the beauty of the natural world including the Arctic with polar bears or coral reefs that are such an incredible thing. The extra heating is a gigantic problem. Coral reefs start dying off in that higher temperature, and so you have these bleaching events that are big die-offs. We haven't given up on any of those natural ecosystems. Uh, if we can limit the temperature rise, we hope that some species of coral uh, will be able to deal with the problem and we can repopulate the areas where the corals have died off with those corals. For humans as well, we do need uh, to help out the poorest to do farming near the equator. So adaptation, which means making better seeds for them, 
that's greatly underfunded. Most people think about mitigation, which is the effort to get emissions from the 51 billion all the way down to zero. And so we do need to do both in parallel, help the people who are suffering, while at the same time, we stop causing more of a problem. You know, I wish we could get to zero before 2050, but that's probably our best case. We'll have to have adaptation and mitigation uh, to deal with all these problems. How's it going, Bill? My name is Destin Sandlin. I live here in North Alabama. I have a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. I like to explore the world using science, and I'm an old-fashioned mechanical and aerospace engineer. In your book, um, I want to hone in on chapter six. You talked about nuclear energy, and I'm a fan of nuclear energy. In fact, my house is powered by the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant, and I just view nuclear energy as a very smart, intelligent bridge to green power. I know there's a lot of people that worry about nuclear energy because of things like Fukushima and Chernobyl. There's this worry about safety, but I find them to be extremely safe when I dig into the research. So what are your thoughts on strategies to communicate the efficiency and safety of nuclear power? Hi, Destin. Great to meet another fan of, of nuclear energy. Nuclear has an amazing starting point because nuclear energy emits no greenhouse gases. There are very few technologies that do that. Hydro does that, but we can't add much new hydro. Wind and solar do that, but they're intermittent. And so if you get a cold front over the Midwest, those will be shut down for several weeks at a time. Unfortunately, with nuclear power, the design that we started with back in the 1950s, there's never been a time when that got changed. And even though the deaths, as you say, are extremely low, mainly due to one big accident in the USSR at Chernobyl, that's what's plagued the nuclear industry but they've never actually gone and done a design from scratch whose safety and economics can be far beyond anything we have today. And so I am funding a nuclear fission company called TerraPower, and the plan is to build a plant starting from scratch and saying, hey, we can't rely on an operator to push the right button. I know, you know, we have a lot of convincing to do, but I think as people think about climate change and this reliability equation, they'll have to say, well, I'm a skeptic, but it could be a absolutely critical part of the solution, not just in the US, but around the entire world. Hello, everyone. I am Prajita Kori, a YouTuber and an actor based in India that uses comedy to show real life in a new way. I feel very passionate about using my platform to create conversations that bring about positive change. I traveled to the UN headquarters to participate in the International Day of Tolerance and for the Goalkeepers Program, which is an initiative by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You've been working towards a better world for many years now through your work with Gates Foundation. Was there a specific incident or an insight that sparked your interest in making all these conversations about climate change? Hello, Projecta. I'm impressed by all the different ways you're using your voice. I came to this work by going to Africa and seeing that the energy poverty there was holding those countries back. Melinda and I realized that getting electricity, getting air conditioning, getting lighting at night was going to be important. And so I had to study, what about this climate problem? Should that be a constraint on just building coal plants, which in many places would be the cheapest way to make electricity? Or do we need to do it a, a better or different way uh, for these countries. And what I've learned is actually the places that will suffer the most from climate change are actually these developing countries. The rich countries are more in the temperate parts of the world and the poor countries are more in the equatorial regions where the poorest are people who do subsistence farming. So the basic idea of justice that everyone can live a healthy and productive life brought me to climate change. I wrote this book because I'm excited that we have a goal. Getting from 51 billion tons of emissions down to zero by 2050. And I'm excited that lots of people are very committed to this cause, particularly young people. So those are two of the three ingredients to solve the problem. The third one is that we need a plan. 
our only hope is to follow that model that worked for the electric car and have innovation. You know, it's only 30 years. And so the whole planet's gonna have to collaborate on this and innovate our way all the way down to zero. Boy, we need a dozen more, uh, you know, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs type people. There's a lot of room for heroes in this space.